It's Leo Sidron from the Third Story Podcast coming to you today from the Bowers and Wilkins Sound Lounge at the Moxie Hotel. We're being live streamed via the Winter Jazz Fest on Relics. We are speaking to you at this moment through Rode microphones, and I'm here with my new friend, Lila Bialy. Hi, Ben. Oh, I called you Ben. Leo. Can I tell you something? <laughs> We've only just met, <laughs> and you've already done the thing. Oh, my gosh. Has anyone else done that before? It has happened. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Leo, it's such a pleasure to meet you finally. I know, we've just been chatting yeah. here uh, quickly, catching up, and actually, yeah. as is always the case, yes. it's the conversations that happen off mic that are, th that are the, the ones you wish you could capture. Right. There's no way we could go back and get what we just got. Yeah. But uh, what we have established is that you were a New Yorker. Yep. You know, some people would argue with that. They say there's like a number of years. You Nine years is what New Yorker magazine said. It's such an arbitrary number, or seems an arbitrary number. And but you that almost is made it. Almost made it. Eight and a half. <laughs> you said, before it's too late, I'm going to exactly leave. Exactly Before right, anybody accuses right. me. But so tell me, you're, you were here for the Winter Jazz Fest, but... Um, it was a little bit like a homecoming for you? To, what does yeah. it feel like when you come to New York? It, it does. I'm honestly, so um, we also played Brockwood last night, and we decided to hop in an Uber. We've been taking the subway everywhere, but last night we had to pick up our son from Brooklyn. And um, so we were in the Uber heading to Lower Manhattan, and you know, you do that thing where you pass the bridge. And I half expected us to take the bridge back to our old place in Prospect Heights. I mean, really, for a moment, I, we were still living in Brooklyn in my mind. Um, but it did feel like a homecoming. I mean, our, my life creati creatively is still split between Toronto and New York, as it always was. Mm -hmm. Even when I was living in New York full time, mm -hmm. I still had really strong ties in Toronto, where I lived for 10 years prior to moving to, to New York. And now that we've been back in Toronto for almost five years, it's, it's still this kind of dual city life. I always tell myself, I. I I don't want to leave until I know I'm done with yeah. the city, but I don't know if you ever do feel like the you're done with the city. The city's done with you, yeah. yeah right, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there's that old cliche that you can take the boy or the girl out of the city, but you can't take the city out of the, the boy or girl. And um, I think New York really sticks sticks to you, especially if it felt like home. And I, I mean, when, when we... When I showed up here, I mean, I met Ben in New York yes. in 2007 at, at Euphoria Studios. Uh -huh, yeah. We just celebrated 10 years. Congratulations. Um, with your husband, Ben Whitman, the yeah, drama husband producer. Yeah, husband, Ben Whitman. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's like when I got here, I mean, I was like, th this is home. Where have these people mm -hmm. and where has this place been my whole life? Mm -hmm. I've never felt such a powerful resonance with a city and I, I'll tell you, when we moved back to Toronto, and I love Toronto, and Toronto has been so good to us, um, and it is home, but, you know, I, I did feel displaced. I mean, my, my heart was still very much in New York, certainly for the first couple of years, and, uh, and uh, New York will always be a part of me. Interestingly, you know? though, your new record was yeah. written, in, it seems, mostly since you left New York. Yes. And your previous record? Was really between the two cities. So that was a transitional. It was a transitional record. And in fact, it sounds a little corny, but the record itself, because there was so much tr transition in our lives, um, felt almost like, a, like gave us a sense of home, the music itself, mm -hmm. and producing it and finishing it over the course of a couple of years gave us, like, was an anchor for us in a very tumultuous time. But do you have a sense that, I mean, you have sort of been able to assert yourself individually as an artist after leaving New York. Yeah. And it's an odd thing, right? You come here to make your statement, but in fact, there's more space maybe? You know, I think New York gave me the permission to step outside of the box, whatever mm -hmm. that box was. I discovered that as much as you get, you still have kind of your musical factions where mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, you've got the real, like, the super jazz purists. I really learned that perhaps, perhaps as a function of having to like stay alive and put food on the table, musicians here are very genre fluid. Yes. They like, they are not, you know, oh, you can only play jazz. And you know, they're, they're so open to different styles and how those styles intermingle. I mean, it's inevitable when you're playing all sorts of kinds of music. And in a way, that's what happened to me. I was touring with Suzanne Vega and Paula Cole and then Sting. 
And that all happened while I was living in New York. Yes. And 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 I think you know as we're spongy as yes. musicians, and you start to really absorb these sounds um, from the people you're working with. And then it started to kind of show up in my music, and I was so afraid to put these songs out there that weren't jazz. Be- because when you moved here, was the the sort of intention was I'm a jazz person. I'm a jazz person. Yeah. Who is deeply fascinated with singer songwriter right. music and pop and whatever you know whatever you want to call it yes. artists like sting yes and um and i think that's also why i loved his music so much was he used you know jazz musicians in his band sure. so he was already kind of exploring this nexus of of jazz and pop yeah the interesting thing with him is that he started to do that after he had established some pop credibility and so i that's think it right. was it was a little bit like a like a balloon that he sent up in the air to the jazz heads that he yeah. he, he was hip you know because that's right because his pop fans probably had no idea yes. who Kenny Kirkland was or Branford Marsalis totally. or Omar Hakim or whoever, you know. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Whereas you had to do it the other way. Right. You had to take your jazz identity and then sort of admit that you also like singer-songwriters and pop. Exactly. And it was kind of an admit, especially yeah. when I was living in Toronto still. and like I, It was more hidden when yeah. I was in Toronto. And then when I came to New York it just started to kind of open up for me. And Ben was the one who, I have this record, it was our first co-production called House of Many Rooms that Uh is unapologetically not jazz. Yes. And Lisa Fisher sings on it, Joe Laurie sings Mm -hmm. on it. And and he was the one who said, stop trying to change those songs into something that your jazz following will accept. Mm -hmm. Let the songs define what they want to be. Yes put them out and see what happens. You know, the fact that we've mentioned so many times this creative relationship that you have with your husband, with Ben, you know, speaks to a question that I, that I wanted to talk to you about, yeah. which is there are creative partnerships that emerge and sometimes they happen in couples also, and yeah. they're really unique, you know? Yeah. Um, and it seems like I hear you saying over and over that that's been a really defining part of your journey. Absolutely, it has. Yeah, he um, he's such a unique person, and um, you know, he went to New England Conservatory as a drummer and percussionist, but then he started getting into production mm-hmm. on the side and produced a band called The Story, who were well known. You know, I guess in the '80s, right, in '90s. Like, no, well, the record that I loved, the, the Angel in the House, was like '90 90 or '91. Okay, so maybe. maybe it was the '90s then. But there was a, there there that was really the last record I think he did. I mean, I don't want to okay. speak for him, but yeah. with them, but I think that there was one before called Grace and Gravity. Yes, yes, exactly. So they, and that was late '80s, probably. Okay, thank you. I should my timeline should. As be you more know, defined. I was a total fanboy <laughs> of this band. Right, and I I actually didn't know anything yeah. about them. Um, so I, I met Ben through uh, Paula Cole, yeah. and they had met in Boston when they were both college kids. Yes. And then I, this is just a quick backstory. I had been touring with Chris Bodie, yeah. at, like a kind of smooth jazz trumpet player, and he happened to have the same producer that Paula Cole had, Bobby Columbi. Hmm. I was scooped out of Chris's band and put with Paula Cole yeah. as a piano player and backup singer, and that's where I met Ben. And Bobby was essentially resurrecting Paula's career and Ben and and Paula, you know, went way back. So he was put in the band as a drummer. And then I, of course, discovered that he was this wonderful um, producer and multi-instrumentalist and just this musical, um, you know, just a, a brilliant musical person. And uh, and we, you know, really uh, resonated with each, each other as people. And we were also the only two people in the band who were unattached. Uh-huh. <laughs> And on the road, that's so convenient. We, yeah, right. It's like band camp or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, totally. We sort of found our way to one another, yeah. and then and then we started to really discover one another's artistic uh, backgrounds and and personalities, and and started to explore that directly instead of just in in association with what Paula with was with what doing. she was doing. But what is it yeah. like to live in this sort of closed circuit of a personal and creative relationship? I mean, there's like no exit there. You know, it's interesting. Um, now and then, if I'm really candid, uh, I've wondered, okay, should I now, you know, like, see if Larry Klein wants to produce a record, or, um, you know, uh, do I want to, like, like, ask Robert Glasper, mm-hmm. like, depending on which, these are, they're both heroes of mine right. as producers, and they're also producers who are known for handling crossover projects. That's right. Um, 
but I think Ben and I have, have explored some really unique territory um, in terms of my own creative. And it's gone really well. Like we never, it's never created friction within our marriage. Yeah. Um, but I have wondered if I, like occasionally I'll question his objectivity, right? We're married and he sort of gets on board with everything I do. And, and, and sometimes I'm like, wait, do I need someone to come in and just sort of go, this is not okay. He's so diverse that, I mean, my records always end up being very eclectic. Yes. And I, especially the ones I've made with Ben. And I have wondered, like, do I need a Larry right. Klein or a Robert Glasper or somebody like that or a Mike Leake to come in and say, this is the sound, this is the concept, we're going to stick very closely with this. Yes. So that the... Um, you know, there's like a, a real sense of continuity. I think that it really speaks to a question of what production is, and yeah. it can go so many different ways. Right. You know, sometimes I feel like watching great producers, so much of what they do is say yes and let artists feel valued and important yeah. and creative and that their ideas matter. And so yeah. by saying yes, he's doing the job of a producer. And on the other hand, and also the records have an identity and they don't sound like a Larry Klein production or a Michael League production or right. a Robert Glasper production. They, they sound like your productions and the ones right. that you do with him. And having identity is really crucial also. Yeah. But I was asking myself that qu same question. Like you? when you bring a lyric or a song idea or yeah. something to Ben, I mean, if he doesn't like it or if he, yeah. d you know, what, what happens in a marriage, w in a relationship when there are disagreements creatively? Oh, we're, f we're fine. Yeah. In fact, I, W I welcome it, yeah. um, and I'm. He's the more even keeled of us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the one who, you know. I mean, he has. To, he's my steady Eddie when we're on the cusp of releasing yeah. an album because I, you know, I like want to throw it away by the time we're done because I'm so fatigued. You know, you put your whole self into the music, and then you come out the other side and, and you question everything. Yes. I don't know if you go through this. Oh my god! As a creative, yes. And he's the one who's like. This sounds like you. It's okay. Please rest assured. I can say as an artist that what we've done together is worthy of releasing into the world. Um, but yeah, so especially when it comes to lyrics, because uh, lyrics are not my strong suit. In fact, mm -hmm. that they're they're the hardest thing for me because I'm I was first an instrumentalist. Yes. I wanted to be a concert pianist when I was a kid, and when I fell in love with jazz. It was with the music of Maria Schneider and mm. Kenny Wheeler, and I wanted to be a big band composer. And that's why when I came to New York in 2003 just to study, I studied with Fred Hirsch and mm. Jim McNeely. And then it was really after discovering Sting and Joni Mitchell that I, like, you know, in my mid-20s, started to explore writing songs and hated everything that came out. And it was Ben who said, you don't need to be, you're not going to be Leonard Cohen. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be Joni. Yeah. These are like poet laureates. Well, you're Canadian, so of course yeah, these are the... Yeah, that's these like, are the they're, they're the golden standard. Yes. Um, and, and in fact, Canada, you know, the more I think about it, there's just something so incredible about what comes out of Canada. I mean, yeah. there's just brilliant songwriters. Man. And I don't really know enough about Canada to understand why that yeah. is. But, you know, you're, yes, of course. Well, they all, what's interesting is, so Canada is so good at supporting its artists. Ah. Um, I almost want to say, I'm not sure I would have a career without the support of Factor, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council. They all support our creative endeavors. Yes. You have to apply, and it means that I'm almost a full-time administrator and grant writer. Yes. Like that's really what I'm doing behind the scenes all the time, which is like the gla the not so glamorous thing that you don't want people to know, but it's the reality for me. Do you feel this? Uh, so you sent me a Dropbox link yeah. last night to listen to your record yes. because it's not available yet. Yes. And your Dropbox is so beautifully organized. Oh, thank you. It was you. one of, because I go through this when I release things <laughs> too. I have a Dropbox link <laughs> I can send to somebody, but I just got taken to school with your oh, Dropbox. Oh, that's kind. And so I'm not surprised to hear that you've had to do all of this administration. Oh stuff. my gosh! It's but do you feel sometimes I feel like I'm less of an artist because I have to spend my time doing these things? O honestly, uh, if you and Ben could tell you this, if if I told you how many times I'm at the piano in a given year in our home, I could count it, count them on two two hands. That's sad. But that's so in order to be a professional. That's right. 
That's I'm what you have hustling. to do. Yes. I'm hustling. Yes. And I'm at my computer. I'm playing the wrong keyboard, as I say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I uh, now that things have gr- are growing for me professionally, and it's taken, I mean, I'm 39. It's taken like 19 years, you know? Whoa. No, I joked about that to my 40th Holy year. I finally had some breakthrough God. in my own career. Well, and I thought, it. I'm a new artist at 40. I'm an emerging artist Isn't at 40. But you also have to celebrate that that's possible. Yes. You know, and that the drive within us to create is so strong. Yes. That at 39, yes. 40, 41, yes. 40, et cetera, we are still so committed, no matter how many times we've been beat down. Well, you know? and in fact, I think that's whether or not the music that you make behaves as jazz per yeah. se, yeah. there's something about the jazz community and the jazz approach allows you and encourages you to age through it. Yes. You know what I mean? You don't have to be new. That is true. So it's funny you should say that. When we released House of Many Rooms, yes. um, Ben and I, we started like charting on college radio, yeah. mainstream college yeah. radio, whatever that means. That sounded like a you know an oxymoron. But <laughs> but um, and good we were college like, radio. We were like, we should run with this. And I had a manager who now manages like John Batiste mm-hmm. and he, the band that called us the duo. He's mm-hmm. he's no longer with them, but. And he's with Mick Management, which is like they've got some great artists. And and um, he was the one who was like, you know, I don't know that you want to like totally rebrand yourself as like the new Feist. Right. It's going to take a lot. And and um, so, you know, it w- that record was really important because it reestablished me as a or established me in a way as a songwriter. I'd always written original music, but it was always instrumental. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a stepping out as a songwriter. And then, at, you know, thereafter, the last record, the eponymous record, yep. and the new one, you know, s- the writing is still an important piece. Um, so, so House of Many Rooms really served its purpose. But as you just said, it's been so wonderful to kind of come back more close mm-hmm. to jazz and the yes. jazz sound and the jazz ethos because and the jazz world because they will embrace an artist into their 70s yes and beyond and interestingly they they will accommodate a a more or less pop sound especially nowadays right when you've got people like esperanza yes and and robert glasper like just pushing the boundaries yes and becca stevens you know i think yes who i love i think about becca's transition yes and how i think she still sort of belongs to the jazz community she sure does and they embrace her even though if you heard the most recent records you wouldn't even necessarily know where it came from that's right it's interesting to me that you say that you struggle with the lyrics or the lyrics are the sort of the last thing that came to you because you're at a point now where I think you really are starting to make some statements and say some, you know, very intentional things. There's this quote in the winter jazz program. There's a photo of you and there's a quote that they used in which you said, you know, I don't take lightly my privilege for advocacy, my privilege that I have a a, a platform to speak publicly and that I that artists can be advocates. Yes. And I feel that in your writing right now also. Oh, that means a lot. So is that part of what's happening with you? Absolutely. I think, I think that's why I still write. I, I don't think I would write b- just because I, you know, like in the shadow of Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen, like who, what, you know? Yeah. But I, it is that I do have something to say and yeah. I have a responsibility to say it. Um, and I feel that. And, um, you know, whether it's responding to, <laughs> to what's happening in the world politically uh, or, you know, the refugee crisis, um, uh, tragedies and like that I've seen friends go through in my own life. I mean, one of the reasons that, to speak candidly for a moment, that we left New York, um, our, Ben's cousin uh, took her own life in 2015. Mm. Ben was the one who found her mm. and the family fell apart. Mm. And it was for us almost like the proverbial straw where we were like we the the, the new york beatdown had had gone too far and we were like we can't yeah we can't we, be we here we can't do this anymore you know we need to provide a place where our family we had uh, josh was 5 at the time yeah. can grow and thrive but then you know 5 years later the song came out and it was actually from a poem ben had written about the 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 death of his cousin mm-hmm. Um, called Glass House that deals with it tells her story it's a little cryptic yep. but it's, it deals with the subject of, of suicide Yes. and I'm someone who struggled with uh, mental health you know I mm-hmm. can say that very honestly um, I'm not ashamed of it 
and I have such a naturally sunny disposition. Most people wouldn't know it. Yes. But it, I have grappled with that yes. for over a decade. It's in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the things that c appear in my songs because it's yes. what I'm thinking about yes. every day, you know? So, yeah. I was thinking about the way you open your new record is a song that is clearly political yes. and, and <laughs> extremely topical. And the world, the political world, is changing so quickly. Yeah. I mean, I'm listening to this album a uh, short time before the al it comes out. Yeah. By the time it's released, we have no idea what mess we'll be in and what new oh, event will have taken place and what right. new yeah. marches will have happened or, you yes. know, fires will have burned or whatever yeah. it is. And, and I was thinking what a challenge that is to make a political statement in this day and age because it's changing so quickly. Yeah. And you managed to, to get um, the Swedish... Uh, yes, uh, what Greta, is Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. Yeah. You know, and I love the reference to her in the song. And I, and I think it's also very powerful to be topical, so yeah. topical. But I was thinking, boy, it's shifting so quickly that you might have to write new verses to I the song. I know, I know. And wouldn't that be something and we could do them live? Yes, exactly. You know? Yeah. It's, it's a strange time, but it's also an exciting time. You know, as, as sort of, it's, it's cliche to put it this way, but as the darkness, like profound darkness, ages old darkness um, is exposed, people are right, like the Gretas of the world yes. are rising up out of the ranks and going, this is not gonna work. Yes. You know, something needs to change and has to give. And then it's like Mother Earth is showing us, especially when it comes to the climate, that such is the case. Right. And But th one of the questions that has been emerging over the last couple of years for me, and that I talk about a lot with yeah. other artists, is so what is our job here? You know, yeah. I mean, I remember talking to... Um, uh, the girls, uh, our mutual friends in Duchess about... Oh, yeah, Amy Servini, uh, yeah, Melissa exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, yes, and, and talking to them about if it's... Oh, because they're political. In, yeah. in their own way, they are political. Yeah, sure they are. But they're also very kind of entertaining and sunny. And Absolutely. it's like, you know, can you do both right now? And what yeah. is our job? I think, like, you know, you lead with a song that is a protest song, yeah. in a sense. And so... Yeah. But you also have, and you have songs that are sort of, you know, heavy and and yeah. and even this song of yours, "Sugar," <laughs> which I w I was so happy when I got to the song "Sugar" on the record, and I thought this has got to be a single, and I it's think it is going to. I think it is going to be a single. Month. Yeah. But then I learned that it's all. It was also slightly informed yeah. by um, a poem about addiction. Yep. Um, how do you feel about that balance between being political or or? asserting yourself in the t sort of dark days of the yeah. 21st century as opposed to being an entertainer or being, you know, spreading light as well. Well, the people I've admired mo that I admire most, um, are they kind of tread that line. At, like the Bruce Coburns of mm -hmm. the world. He'll talk about, he like you know, the rocket launchers and then, and then sing the most crushingly beautiful song about love. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that is the human experience. You have the darkness, you have the light, to put it very plainly and yes. simply and I'm always fascinated I think also as a spiritual person by that tension you know uh, Bono on um, what was the the record about the atomic bomb how to dismantle an atomic bomb I think that was the name of the record uh, do we, can do we, we get uh, anything yeah, yeah. from the relics guys no, calling, calling all <laughs> relics no. folks so I think it was how to dismantle yeah. an atomic bomb yeah. and um, he had a song called Yahweh and it was mm -hmm. why the dark before the dawn? Mm -hmm. Like why, you know, why do we have to be taken to the brink? Yes. Sort of to find the light in some cases. Or hit bottom. I mean, in the case That's of right. depression or addiction, it's the and, same and thing. And unto death. Yes. Right? Yes. Like where's the light in that? Yes. But I am so fundamentally hope-filled. Yes. Like at the end of it all, I do believe fundamentally in something good mm -hmm. i do i do <laughs> so it i think it, it that is the heart of every song yes you know no matter how sad or dark the subject matter yes yeah. it's a, it's you know you mentioned earlier this thing about ooh, having that self-doubt before you put out a project is this worth oh. putting out into the world and it's a funny thing because oh. i think 
we only can make what we make. I mean, we don't have oh. a, a total control over what comes out of us, you right. know? I agree with you. It, it actually is like a birth. I liken it to a birth uh -huh. where this thing, I mean, and it's yes. like, that's sort of bizarre yes, metaphor you know, for a man. For a man, yes. But it's like, you know, this thing is taking shape within you. Yes. And then once it's out in the world, you have to support it and love it, even if it's, you're like behaving like in your errant child or not everybody l loves it yes. or, or there's something that you perceive as a flaw yes. or that the world criticizes or, you know, but you have to support it and love it and, and allow it to, to be in the world yes. and bring something to the world. Yes. I go back and f I mean, I, I, yes. And, you know, I feel like on the one hand, I, I have work that I've done that I don't love, but I know that some people like it. Yeah. And and so it doesn't fully belong to me at that point. Yeah. And then on the yes. other hand, I think like, but maybe the barometer f should always just be, can you stand by it when you play it for somebody? And then right. what it, whether they like it or not doesn't matter because you can stand by it. I think it's both. Yes. I think it's both. Yes. I, I love that you shared that because that by and large is my experience. Yes. I'm so profoundly self-critical and self doubting yes that the entire record pretty much that you've now heard yes. I'm like I don't know I don't know which is like a very kind of silly to say I'm like out there promoting, promoting a record, record. <laughs> yes yes and I've watched by the way sting is a master of like you know kind of getting behind his work although yes. he can also be self-critical can he? As behind yes he can behind the scenes uh, we've had a couple of conversations that were shocking to me and heartening because he's my hero yes and um, but anyway so uh, I think what you said about like sometimes y you know there's a song that made it on there because yes. somebody, somebody believed in sure. it. Sure. And you go, oh, should it be on there? You know, I don't know. But then it is, and and someone else says to you, that song yeah. has moved me. Yes. And you go, okay. Oddly, you Or go, do you think, can I respect this person anymore? Ah! This person that I thought I liked? I found it really affirming. Yes. So on the last record, there was a song called Dolores Angel. Mm -hmm. And one of the, actually my friend Wendy, who uh -huh. I wrote the song, Wendy's song for. Uh -huh. um, she's no longer with us. Um, she had terminal cancer. But when I released the last record, that was the one song she was like, I don't know if it should be on there. And that was like Jonathan Brooks' favorite. And she is like, you know, I bow to yes. her... The, her as a songwriter. Yes. And and so it just goes to show, you know, a lot of it is in fact taste. Yes. And um, something that one person may find kind of silly or that I might even find a little silly will resonate for somebody Sure. Else. Well, and you, you know, you close your new record with a song that you wrote with, with your 9-year-old son. son. Stay yeah. in bed, take the day off. Take the day off. Take the day off. And he didn't he actually the lyrics are very childlike, but he didn't write the lyrics. What he wrote it was a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. We love the weekends. Yes. Because, you know, it just, I don't know. I feel like with a child who's in school, it's always kind of a flail through the week. Yes. And then you have this moment Saturday morning where you can all just kind of <gasps> take a breath mm -hmm. and just be in your own space, but together. Yes. And so it was one of those Saturday mornings. And Ben, for some reason, had his, it's called a tongue drum or a, a log drum. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful African instrument. Mm -hmm with you know these and it's 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 almost like a thumb yeah piano, like a the way that it, the, yeah a yeah, uh, the way kalimba it's pitched yeah. it's like not linear yes and he was just with the mallet just ding 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 this like take going around cycling around the instrument yes repetitively in an almost meditative meditative way and i went that is so beautiful and so i was like i'm gonna write a little song over mm -hmm. that and that's what I did. Huh. And so I gave him a credit because that was his little that, you know, I, Austin I am credited on some of my father's songs from when I was five and six oh, and seven for doing oh, very sweet. little. But but I relate yeah. to that so deeply because it's a way of welcoming the next generation into that's this right. thing that you do and your family, you know. That's right. And he and Ben are in the studio writing music. I love Where that. he is actually generating all the pieces of the song. Yes. And taking full ownership. Yes. So. Well, I'll talk to him in 15 years. Yeah. So I feel like there's a couple things to discuss. I just want to make sure yeah. you're not going to miss your airplane. Oh, oh you, you are going to miss your airplane if we. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk for a few more yeah. minutes. Um, 
since you've been back in Canada, you've also become a, a radio personality. Yes. yes. And and you've been a journalist, a DJ. What are you? A host of a, sh- a, of host. a show? You're a host. I host a show with the least creative name on the face of the planet, but also the most clear name. It's yes. called Saturday Night Jazz. And and so you play jazz on Saturday nights. I play jazz yeah. on Saturday nights on CBC Music across Canada. Uh-huh. I love my CBC family. I have been a rabid CBC fan my whole life. Were you interested in being a broadcaster? Was no. that something that you wanted to do? No. How did we it come up? We were living in Canada when we, uh, shortly after, we, a couple years after we'd moved. Um, I got approached to sub for their longtime jazz host, Tim Tamashiro. He had yep. a show called Tonic. Yep. Six nights a week, 8 to 10 p.m. And he was taking a summer off. And they were doing a sort of a thematic thing where they brought in a bunch of jazz sure. singers most of them based in Toronto, to sub for Tim for a week. Yep. And they gave me three weeks. And then at the end of that um, season, uh, the uh, then kind of host developer, Anne McKeegan, who's now with Q, which is like mm-hmm. kind of CBC's flagship uh, radio show, um, she said, are you enjoying this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And, uh, and she said, how would you like to do this full time? Well, not full time, yeah. but... How have would this you be like yours. to become the yes. face and voice of jazz on CBC Music? Tim had been at the show or at the at the station for uh, ten years and was ready to retire, and I said okay. And actually, what made it possible was that they were downsizing the jazz show to one night a week mm-hmm. for four hours. And is it um, live? Do you do live? Or you tape it? Okay, you don't have to. I you don't tape have to. it. I tape it. Yeah, but. Uh, but the spirit of it is live. How, do, how does being in touch with that aspect of yeah. the business and the world of the music change or affect your sense of identity in the world of jazz? Well, you know what? You know, I kind of arrived at this way of describing it early on, and I just this is what I say, and it's true. So as a performer, I feel like I'm inviting people into my space. Mm-hmm. So I kind of occupy whatever venue it becomes my living room and mm-hmm. you are my guests and you come over and mm-hmm. I get to, you know, regale you with stories and share music. And as a broadcaster, I feel like people are invi- inviting me into their space, mm. wherever they may be, whether it's their car, you know, but they're inviting me to accompany them wherever they are that Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And that feels kind of feels like sacred ground to me, if I'm honest. And it's given me such an appreciation for my fellow musicians. Yes. I get introduced to so much new music because of my producer who chooses the music for the show. Uh-huh. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Has it? Do you think it has had any influence on the music that you make or the way you think about um, what you do? Yeah, yes, perhaps in that, you know, it is jazz. I mean, the fourth hour especially crosses over um, and, and explores more experimental jazz. But the first three hours are, are like... You know, classic jazz, reaching back to Ella Fitzgerald and yes. Louis Armstrong. And then, you know, certainly contemporary um, and, you know, a few subgenres of, of jazz. But it reminds me why I love jazz, you know. But it's interesting that it doesn't sound like your record would be a contender. Mm, I mean, nope. it probably makes things a little simpler in a way, but... Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, we're, we're not allowed to play my music on my show, right. obviously, right? But, I mean, but, I, uh, I have a similar experience. A lot of the yeah. people that I talk to... Um, for my podcast are yeah. making a much more, I think, pure version of jazz. I don't want to say pure. It's a, yeah. I'm, I'm, now I'm, I can't believe I'm going to get hung up on ah, these terminologies yeah, yeah, myself, yeah. but I think I, I don't know that I would necessarily fit in the same uh, category sometimes that yeah. I'm exploring. Yeah. You know, and it's an inter- right. interesting thing. I know. And occasionally I felt like a fraud for that reason, yes. but I have such a deep love for the tradition. Yes. Um, even though you may not always recognize it in the music that I create, I have such a respect and love. Yes. And I, like I listen to these tracks as we're taping the show and just, you know, for the most part, revel in what I'm hearing, whether it's familiar or new. Yes. And uh, yeah, it's great. I, it's such a privilege. What a nice thing. And also, I think what, a, you know, it speaks again to Canada and, and, and yeah. how what Canada has provided for you, you know? It, you know what? I, I actually think things have kind of taken off for me since we've returned to my home country, my homeland. Yes. And now I get to have this wonderful, you know, again, dual city or even country existence. I'm a dual citizen, literally. Mm. Um, but from the Canadian side, which yes. I'm happy with, you know, it's, it's it works for me for the time being. Sure. And, and again, I think it's fluid. My husband's American and, and Josh is, is dual and, 
and uh, you know the border feels fluid to us. So yeah. Well, Lila Bialy, thank you for spending your last moments in New York thank before you, you've got to go back o- over the border. Uh, we have so much more we could have covered. Congratulations yeah. on your new record. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show. Coming to you, signing off now from uh, the Bowers and Wilkins Sound Lounge at Moxie. Uh, see you soon. Lila Bialy, Leo Sidrin, <laughs> Road Microphones. Ciao. 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 Yay. Yeah. We-